as the bombs were falling, you can hear this whistling, blah, 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 and it gets louder and louder. And as the as it gets closer, uh, I just thought, God protect me. On today's podcast, we're going to explore a little known hot zone that you probably haven't heard much about, but there's some big things going on there. That's Sudan. That's all coming up on today's hot zone. This is the hot zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Okay, we've got Ryan Boyette, and this is a guy that I've admired for a long time. Ryan, tell me about your background and how you ended up living in Sudan. Well, Chuck, thanks for the uh, opportunity. Um, so I had read an article years ago, back in 2002, about the persecution of the church in Sudan, and that caught my interest. Um, I started asking a lot of questions, why is no one doing anything about this? And then I just pointed the finger back at myself and realized, you know, I need to ask myself that same question. So I started exploring ways to go to Sudan. Um, I went there with Samaritan's Purse and worked with them um, in a place called the Nuba Mountains uh, that had seen war. I, I arrived at a period of a five-year window of peace, and they had 25 years civil war um, prior to that. Um, so as we arrived, I was doing a lot of development work um, for eight years in the Nuba Mountains and other parts of uh, Sudan and South Sudan. So when war started in 2011, so after that window of peace, uh, we started seeing signs that the war might start again. And as a result, the president of the country was talking about, you know, destroying. He even referred to people as insects um, and chased them from their mountains and things like that. So we saw signs of war coming up. So then uh, Samaritan's Purse evacuated and I resigned and stayed. My wife and I stayed in Nuba and we felt that it would be hypocritical of us to leave after that's been our home for so many years. And because of our faith and, and just up and leave, it just didn't seem right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we stayed. Uh, I started a media organization called Nuba Reports at the time and uh, pulled together some Sudanese uh, journalists. We all worked together and were reporting on the conflict. Um, we were at the front lines every day reporting on um, over uh, 6,000 bombs dropped in the Nuba Mountains um, on villages, on homes, reported on the burning of villages, hundreds of thousands of people displaced. Um, many people heard about Darfur back in 2003 and four, um, but the same thing was going on in the Nuba Mountains and another place called Blue Nile, and that's where we were reporting from. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm back in the U.S. Um, there's been a lull in the fighting, and so we're back in the U.S. starting an organization for education called To Move Mountains. Wow. So uh, it, now Sudan has been in the news today because their president um, just got deposed, just got kicked out. Tell me about what happened. Explain that just in a nutshell. So today is a is a very big historical day in Sudan. Uh, Omar Bashir has had power for over 30 years and has seen the, the death and displacement of millions of his own people in Sudan. And as a result, the people have become angry. It's uh, it's brought the economy of Sudan um, way down. And it was hard for people to live, and it caught the attention of people even in the center uh, where he is in Khartoum. And so people rose up since uh, December. Uh, when they rose up, they knew the sacrifice that they were making. They knew that the that they would face live rounds and tear gas and and they could possibly die. But people still rose up and they marched in the streets since December. Well, April 6th was the biggest day that we've seen uh, of, of the marching and the protest. And as a result, the people actually marched in front of the army barracks. And many of the lower level officers and the, the army were actually taking the side of the people and protecting the protesters. Um, you, you saw protesters hugging and women um, um, crying and, and hugging the, the soldiers. Um, so today in the morning, this morning here in the U.S., they, uh, we saw on the news that Omar Bashir was taken out of power and he was arrested. Um, it's unclear where he is right now. Um, there's rumors that he's in Saudi Arabia. There's rumors that he's still in the country. Um, but what is clear is that he is no longer in power. Um, the army made a statement, higher um, uh, members of the army, generals made a statement that they will hold power for two years for a transitional period mm -hmm. and that they impose a curfew um, of the protesters and that Bashir is no longer in power and the protesters can go home. Okay. Uh, now, this might be a question that's above your pay grade. And if so, uh, you know, don't 
take it wrong, but I, no, that's right. I, you know, I've been doing a lot of reporting lately on Venezuela and what's happening mm-hmm. there. And you've got a very similar situation. You've got a dictator holding on to power. You've got the military that's sort of wavering in, in their support of the dictator and the people who are marching in the streets and have been for months and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, very violent, uh, a very bad economy now. And uh, they've, you know, been without electricity for days upon end and they're drinking mm-hmm. out of sewers and stuff like that. And hope, we're hoping to see something very similar to that very, very soon, where the military will finally acknowledge that the people need to be listened to, and they will switch sides and depose this dictator. However, there are other interests who mm-hmm. are very have a vested interest in keeping Maduro in power, and that is specifically Iran and uh, China and Russia. And so they've actually sent troops there now, uh, and so that complicates things somewhat. Are there any outside influences in Sudan that wanted Bashir to stay in power? Yeah, actually, um, it's interesting because a lot of the Islamist um, – Wanted the wanted Bashir to stay in power, mm-hmm. as well as something very strange is the West, and especially the U.S. actually were working to normalize relations with the Sudan government. Um, a lot of what Europe was was doing was actually supporting the Sudan government because they saw them as a way of stopping immigration issues. Um, I personally have gone to many meetings and explained Bashir is not as stable as people think. Um, just because in the north um, the people are, you know, geographically located close to him doesn't mean that they support him. Right. They're tired of war. They've been at war for for over the entire time that he has been in power. They've been at war with themselves, and that is what is killing the economy. Um, yeah. He's shifted from uh, siding with Iran to suddenly siding with Saudi Arabia. Um, the government uh, have just been moving back and forth and have been able to sneak out of out of problems and issues, even though Omar Bashir and many of the people in his government are wanted by the International Criminal Court. So, you know. Well, it doesn't wow, surprise me that the United Nations got it wrong. And I, we see very similar things around the world where these dictators sort of engage in the politics of expediency, you know, kind of, you know, ride whichever horse they think is going to go further. And uh, yep. and so now what happens, though, now that Bashir is gone, are we going to see more warfare as the Islamists go to war, you know, more against the, the Christians or what? So you have areas of Darfur, uh, the Nuba Mountains where I lived, and uh, and Blue Nile, which actually now are more peaceful than they've ever been. Wow! Um, because the army has been pulled back, there's a lot of confusion about who's in power, um, and now most of what's happening is centralized in Khartoum. So the the people have actually denounced what the army leaders said. Now, these are the higher level army. So it's going to be very telling what happens at 10 o'clock tonight. And the reason I say that is because uh, today when the army announced, uh, by the way, that when the army announced, the guy making the announcement is also under U.S. sanctions, a personal U.S. sanctions on him. So people see him as a criminal as well. Now, they made the announcement that at 10 o'clock tonight, there's a curfew. And we will That's very telling because what happens tonight if the people still come out and you see lower level officers and the army still supporting the people, then it is a clear act of defiance of what uh, the army said. On the ground, what I'm hearing is that people are not um, willing to accept the government or sorry, the army uh, as the as the ruling party. They want a transitional government that that includes a lot of different parties that will uh, reach a democratic uh, election later on as the transition happens. Interesting. So explain the the major parties between – in my understanding, and it's been a while since I've really read up much on Sudan. I wanted to come over there and visit you several years mm-hmm. ago, and so I had been doing some reading about that, and then it didn't work out. But uh, – in my understanding, South Sudan for a time was even like issuing its own passport stamps and things like that, uh, trying to actually become its own government. Is that correct? Well, South Sudan actually split in July. As a result of Bashir and his government and what they've done, the people of South Sudan actually had a referendum. So in July 2011, uh, South Sudan split as a result. So Bashir actually lost more than half of his country um, because of people's discontent with him and his government. Um, now, There's still conflict in South Sudan, and a lot of it is a result of Bashir and his government benefiting from conflict in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. So they support 
proxy wars and conflicts and things in South Sudan so that they could benefit from it. So I think now with Bashir out and the possibility of the government changing, depending on how that happens and what happens in the end, there could actually be more peace in South Sudan, Sudan, and regionally because of just what Bashir has had his hands in. So what is life like in Sudan? I've read about that the, it's one of the largest places in the world for human slavery, that there are a lot of uh, problems with the Arabs. Uh, there's a, a, what are they called? I forget, Janissary? No, uh, uh, Janjaweed. Oh, Janjaweed. That's it. Yep. Coming down and taking slaves in the South and things like that. Does that sort of thing still go on? Yeah. So there's, you know, this is the reason why there's conflict in Sudan. That's why there's fighting in the Nuba Mountains and other places. People are protecting themselves against this government. Um, there are still things like that. The, uh, you know, the rapid support force will attack refugee camps and villages. And um, th this is a force that was reporting directly to Bashir. And so these kind of things still happen. Sudan is an extremely remote area. Resources of the country don't come from the center, but of course, all the development and uh, the riches go to the center. So you don't see um, people in these uh, farther uh, marginalized areas getting any of the benefit. So you have people living with very little water, uh, very uh, lack of resources. Um, you know, they grow their own food, but a lot of times they're being bombed and attacked. So uh, famine is an issue. Um, people running to refugee camps are displaced. So it's an extremely remote area. It's hard to live in already. And then you have the government, which is oppressing the people. Now there is, um, you know, people, the government has used uh, politics, geography, ethnicity, and religion to divide people anytime that it benefits them. And that's what they've been doing for years and years. Well, I don't know how much you keep up on American politics, but uh, I would say that there are quite a few politicians trying to do exactly that with yep. <laughs> with the U.S. electorate right now. Um, so what are your plans? Are you going to go back to Sudan now soon, or what, what are you going to do? So... Um, my family and I moved to the U.S. actually to start a uh, organization called To Move Mountains, and we'll be here for three years creating a new curriculum for the people of Sudan and of Nuba Mountains. And that curriculum will be based on critical thinking and their history, and they will be involved in the creation of it so that they can learn about their history from their perspective. Um, so that is what we're going to build. And then in three years, we'll go back and start some schools that will use this curriculum and other schools can adopt it if they if they like it as well. Um, so we're working on that really hard. And uh, I go back and forth to Sudan. Of course, it's, it's my home. I've been there for 15 years. Uh, really miss it. I wish I was there now at this exciting time. Um, but yeah, that's that's our plan. Interesting. Tell me about your family. Uh, so my wife, is, her name is Jazeera, and she is from the New Mountains. She lived her entire life in war. Um, she's a big inspiration to what we're doing in education because she learned to write English and learn math by writing on the ground with her finger because they didn't even have pens or paper. Um, she's dealt with famine, um, dealt with bombing uh, much of her life. And so she's a big inspiration to me and in, in, in what we're doing in our organization. Uh, I have a son who is uh, six years old. He's, he's a wild man and he grew up in, uh, he, he was born in Nuba at our home. And so was our daughter. Our, my daughter is three years old and uh, both of them were born in Sudan and they love it there. Um, so they have family here in the U.S., my family, and, and they have family back in Sudan. Wow, that's great. And uh, is she, I mean, having slept through Antonov's flying over, dropping barrel bombs, yeah. uh, do, does she not like 4th of July very much or does she does she sleep <laughs> right through it? Yeah, actually, we went to our, the last 4th of July was her first time seeing fireworks and, uh, and as well as my son. And both of them had, and, and as well as I, we all had the same reaction. Like it just like made us feel very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, when we first moved to the States, uh, it would be, you know, uh, very late at night, like one in the morning or 12 or something, and, a, and an airplane would fly over and we'd always feel like we have to go outside and lay down because that's just something that we were used to. Um, in 2012, uh, my house was bombed as a result of us reporting on the conflict. And that was uh, obviously very scary. We were OK. God protected us. Um, but in the end, it's it definitely affects us when we hear airplanes. I can hear airplanes now, even though I'm not worried about it here in the U.S., I can still pick up on the sound of an airplane very fast. Oh, I bet. I bet. Now, did you work with the uh, Free Burma Rangers at all when they came over there? I have uh, been in contact with them and I actually wasn't there when they came to the Nuba Mountains. So, um, but they're a great group and uh, yeah, they're, they're really good and doing great work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Tell me a, about 
kind of the hardest moment that you've faced in Sudan? Yeah, so when I was reporting on the conflict, we were getting a lot of attention. Um, we were showing around, you know, big big reporters from New York Times to uh, NBC, Fox News, and then even uh, George Clooney came and we, we were getting a lot of recognition. Well, that put a spotlight on us, and the Sudan government began to notice. Um, suddenly, I learned that my computer was hacked by the Sudan government. Um, then we learned that um, there was a video of our of my wedding uh, in Sudan uh, that was on the government funded news and, and making a lot of false claims about us. And then a few days after that, it was in May 2012 um, at nine o'clock. My wife had gone to the neighbor's house and we heard an Antonov, which is a cargo plane that the Sudan government uses for bombing. And it circled over our house and, it, and our house is very far from the front lines. And there hasn't been a bombing in that area. It's on a plateau. And as the airplane circled the first time, it was a bit not lined up for our house. And I told two friends with me, I said, you know, I think this plane's going to bomb us. And they said, uh, no, Ryan, there's no way they know where your house is. Well, sure enough, the plane circled back and was lined right up on our house. And it was a cloudy day and it came under the clouds. So it was very close. And I had been by many bombings by that point. I, tra I traveled all, th all through Nuba mm -hmm. and seen the bombings, been close to them. But this is the first time that a captain of an airplane woke up with with me and my family as their target. And as the plane lined up, it dropped six bombs in a line. And as the bombs were falling, you can hear this whistling, blah, 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 and it gets louder and louder. And as the as it gets closer, uh, I just thought, God, protect me. Uh, this is, this is uh, my life is yours and it's in your hands right now and protect me. And the first bomb exploded in this, and it was 30, um, about 30 yards from us. The shrapnel flew over me and my friends as we were laying in the hole that I had dug, a very shallow hole. So shrapnel f flew over us. Um, the third bomb landed on the other side of my house, or sorry, the second bomb. And then the third bomb landed um, very close to where my wife was at the neighbor's house who didn't have, they didn't have a, uh, a bomb shelter. So she laid behind a big rock and she was seven months pregnant with our son. And the bomb hit and the shrapnel ricocheted off the rock that she was hiding behind. And that rock protected her. Um, later on, every everyone else was fine. No one was hurt, thank God. And then when my wife gave birth to our, our son, we named him Eben, short for Ebenezer, which means rock of help. And we do feel that God really protected us that day. Um, and while it was very scary, it inspired us to work harder to show the world what was taking place. Because, um, you know, while I'm an American, this is happening to hundreds of thousands of people every every day in, in, in these places in Sudan. Mm -hmm. Wow. Unbelievable. What a story. So how can people pray for Sudan and for your ministry now? Uh, for Sudan, pray for the new leadership. Pray for the people who are out there protesting for their rights and their freedom. Mm -hmm. And pray that they are safe and also pray that the new leadership that comes up will allow freedom of people, will allow Christians to be able to worship and have churches and, and not be bombed and attacked. Pray that um, there won't, you know, the violence will end and there will be open dialogue about how to move forward um, with so many ethnicities and groups and religions in the area. Um, and for our ministry, please pray that we'll be able to make something that can be used by God to just um, reach people in the Nuba Mountains and and give them hope for their future and that they will learn to read and write as they wish and, and learn their history um, and that we will be able to go back soon and do this work uh, to our fullest. Absolutely. Good. So how can people find your, your ministry? Uh, so you can go to our um, website. It's uh, tomovemountains.org, and that's T O. Uh, to move mountains.org. So um, they can read about what we're doing and uh, they can read a little bit more about myself and my family. Mm -hmm. And if they'd like to donate, they can also, there's a button there that says donate. Um, we're looking for monthly donors. Um, but if you can't do that, there's a way to donate a uh, one-time donation. We'd really appreciate it. Um, it's an important time in Sudan right now. And, and people need to think about um, what the next step is now that this government is gone. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, I hope people will do that and go go find your website, twomovemountains.org, and, uh, and donate, because uh, this is obviously good work. That's the kind of thing we like to do here on The Hot Zone. We're not just uh, telling people the news about what's going on from the source, but we're also letting people reach through the news using modern social media and yeah. and make it better and change it, change the news for the better, make it a better, uh, a better day for people who are hurting. So I hope they'll do that with you. Thanks for being on with us. Thank you for the work you're doing over there. Uh, we know that uh, God has a heart for those people and uh, that you're, you're being his hands and feet by, by helping them out. So we appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me on and uh, thank you for all the great work you do as well. Thank you. All right, folks, that's all we've got for today on the Hot Zone. Thanks for being a part of it. If you want to support the Hot Zone, just go to hotzone.podbean.com or uh, patreon.com slash hot zone. You can look us up on Facebook or YouTube uh, or iTunes. And I hope you will share it with your friends. Thanks for being a part of it. I'm Chuck Holton. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.